Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Sarah Brazel, and I'm a program officer at the National Center for Special Education Research. And I'm really excited to um, introduce today's session, Process Pathways to Test Design Hypotheses for Supporting Reluctant and Struggling Readers in Mathia. And I'm really, this, this particular project has been really wonderful to work with because it's so interdisciplinary. We've got a mathematics technology software and, and the addition of reading supports and then the use of large language models and other artificial intelligence approaches. So it's, it's really exciting and I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing uh, what they have to say. And I'm sorry for this, someone who said the page is not found, I will find a better link. Okay, if you have a question during this session, we ask that you put it into the chat and not to, in the Q&A. And I'll be facilitating the questions. Most of the questions we're going to save until the very end, but um, anything that I feel is a clarification question that might be important to ask during the presentation, I will just pause the presentation to ask if they could address that question. Okay, I'll go ahead and turn it over to the Matthew team and CAS team. Thank you, Sarah, I really appreciate it. Um, welcome again, this session is Process Pathways to Test Design Hypotheses for Supporting Reluctant and Struggling Readers in Mathia. Uh, so um, today we're gonna, um, um, here's an agenda. Um, we're going to tell you a little bit about the Marx Project, uh, about Mathia in particular, the platform about upgrade, which is a testing, testing software. Um, and then we'll zoom in on um, design-based research and co-design, which together are the process pathways that we are really excited about sharing. Finally, we'll end with experiments and outcomes. And, um, and then we'll have a discussion uh, based on your questions. So please add your questions to the chat. So before we dig into um, telling you about all of the parts of this work. Um, here's a question to think about as we go through. How much does reading comprehension matter for students in mathematics? That's a central question to our work. So as you think about that, I'm gonna describe a uh, little bit about the project that um, tries to answer that question. So, MARX is the acronym. It stands for Math and Reading Acquisition Co-Adaptive System. And um, essentially, we're trying to work with kids around their understanding of math and their, their literacy skills at the same time. It's funded uh, by Nixer. Um, in, it's a STEM development and innovation project. And Sarah Brazil is our project officer. Uh, it was funded starting in July 2021. Um, it's a three and a half year project, so we're going all the way to December of 2024. Um, so we've got, oh, um, roughly a year and a half uh, to go. So we're sort of in the middle of the, of the work. Um, I'm Jess Gropen, I'm the PI. Uh, we also have Steve Ritter and Steve Pasali, co-PIs, and Kim Ducharme, who's an instructional designer who is um, helping us understand these process pathways. So the goal of Marx is to develop and study a set of student individualized reading supports for middle school students with reading difficulties when learning to solve mathematics problems and specifically embedded within an adaptive mathematics learning system, Mathia. Now, Steve Ritter will tell you more about Mathia. I'm just gonna simply say that when it comes to um, supporting students with reading difficulties, we're actually looking at quite a mix. Um, we're looking at students who have specific um, reading comprehension disability, but also word level reading disabilities or, or both. Um, and it, the literature is pretty clear that there are con often concurrent math difficulties along with those. So there seems to be some connection between these. Um, we can discuss as we go, and uh, probably more in the discussion period, how we've operationally identified struggling readers in the context of Mathia, and um, we can um, uh, certainly get uh, dig into those details. So, um, 
this work is, um, as I mentioned, it's going to um, the um, end of 2024. Um, so we are pretty close to the end of phase one of this research. Phase one um, is um, this period of teacher co-design and student and feedback um, on designed math reading supports. It involves student co-design and play testing our prototypes and actually testing supports with a broader group of students. So we've been doing, even in this phase, quite a bit of work. Um, and you will see a lot of that today. Phase two, which will begin um, uh, probably um, sometime this summer, is uh, a large scale evaluation uh, of a suite of supports implemented in MAFIA. Now, during this phase one, we've developed um, or considered four different kinds of supports. Let me briefly talk a little bit about these um, and we'll zoom in in particular on, um, the, on, on one of them really, the discourse context and simplification. Um, by discourse context and simplification, we're asking the question, do students understand the situation? Do they understand what is being represented by a word problem? Um, it's really about the macro level. If you think about re, um, language comprehension or, or discourse comprehension, so we're interested in the grammar. Um, we're interested in sort of the inferences that um, we naturally make as we comprehend language. Um, so those are a variety of supports that try to um, address um, barriers that come up at that level. Text to speech functions really applies, is, is really self-explanatory. It's about read aloud uh, functionality. I will say, Mathia already has text-to-speech functions. So our work in this case is more about discoverability. Is it discoverable um, uh, by students? Is it discoverable by, by teachers? And um, what, what are the barriers to usage of that kind of functionality? Glossary and, vocab and vocabulary and glossary changes. Now it's down at the micro level. We're interested in word identification and particular issues that students have with words. How can we support their understanding? And in particular, how can we make sure that the glossary is a useful support for struggling readers? And finally, attention and perception is really about the layout. How does the layout support or get in the way of struggling readers? in the context of math. So that involves a variety of different considerations from the font size to um, how much text. Sorry about that. Um, and um, yep. Sorry, the Zoom, a, a, a typical Zoom scenario. <laughs> um, I was hoping I'd get through my section without that, but um, so attention perception contains a number of, of supports and uh, maybe I should move on quickly. <laughs> so final point, the power here lies in combining design-based research and co-design. Um, so by design-based research, I mean interventions that are conceptualized and then implemented iteratively in natural settings to test the validity of a dominant theory and generate new theories and frameworks. So in this case, um, we're working with teachers, we're working with students in context as they use MAFIA. Um, Co-design attempts to actively involve stakeholders in the design process. Um, so, you know, it relocates the end users into the research and design development phases. So it really helps us ensure that the um, solutions are meeting their needs. I will add on top of this, besides combining these things, we're also adding that the um, large language models and the um, that testing uh, capability. So altogether, I think it's a very powerful combination. So on behalf of my dogs and myself, thank you for listening. <laughs> and um, I will um, uh, advance the slide so that Steve Ritter can take it from here. Thanks, Jess. Um, as Jess said, uh, 
This research is uh, taking place in the context of students using Mathia, which is our adaptive software we can see here. Um, it's important to understand some of the background, um, which is uh, we've, uh, Mathia uh, has derived from uh, over 25 years of research in artificial intelligence and education uh, and commercialization of that re research. Um, and so the primary usage of Mathia is as part of a student's uh, normal core mathematics instruction. Um, it's available in middle and high school. We'll be focusing in this project on uh, middle school use of Mathia. Um, and we've done uh, a lot of prior research that has actually shown really good results uh, for students who are struggling readers uh, as defined in various ways. And so um, part of the framing of this research is to really understand better why that's happening and how we can improve the impact on we're that we're having um, on students with reading difficulties. Um, and part of the pedagogy in, in Mathia is to give students a lot of uh, kind of real world or multi-step problems which involve text. And so um, a premise in this work is that we won't, don't wanna necessarily remove text or remove the responsibility for students to decode text when they're doing mathematics. We wanna understand how we can provide the right support so that students within that uh, context of solving word problems and other problems that involve text, um, how we can support um, all students. Um, and so the, we talk about Mathia as, as scaffolding student-directed problem solving. So uh, you can see on the right here, um, one type of Mathia problem. This is a, uh, a geometry problem you may have nightmares about, uh, about figuring out angles uh, um, in parallel line problems. Uh, and the typical approach is we give students problems to solve, which we watch for the AI the cognitive model watches students as they solve problems step by step. Uh, there are multiple steps as you kind of go from the given angles of this problem to derived angles using various theorem, theorems. Um, and you can see kind of in the, um, in the image on the right here um, that even that step of, deri of, of showing an angle that derives from the given angle um, involves kind of multiple steps. We ask the student whether the angle can be calculated because we give them some problems where the lines are not parallel and you can't conclude anything about the angles, for example. Um, we, and we, then we also ask uh, what particular um, geometry theorem is being used to, uh, to make their hypothesis. And there's been a lot of background research on the um, use of those geometry theorems to kind of ground the reasons that uh, leads to better generalization. So there's a lot going on there. Uh, the students uh, solve these multi-step problems. They get feedback that's personalized and contextual, meaning the feedback is personalized in the sense that it takes a, into account what students have done before. Um, and it's contextual in that the feedback is providing hints and um, what we call just-in-time messages that um, respond to specific elements of the problem. So uh, in general, our approach is to provide feedback that tells students how to solve this problem as opposed to just giving kind of a general method for solving parallel lines problems, for example. Um, behind the scenes, we use uh, what's called knowledge component modeling to determine which problems to present. Uh, so you can see that in this slide. Um, is a different kind of problem, uh, just to show you a couple of examples of obviously the, the particular framing of the problem is different from different areas of mathematics. This is a proportional reasoning problem. And you can see in this particular problem, you're hiking at nine miles per day. Uh, and you can see the student as circled on the left, a student's task would be type in one day there. And you can see that that step is associated with a particular skill or knowledge component on the scalometer shown on the right. The scalometer is an element that, that is accessible to both students and teachers, so students know where they stand there. Um, and one of the things that's important here is the kind of fine-grained analysis of student work. So it turns out nine miles per day, since that's a unit rate, the one day is implicit there. Uh, we actually distinguish in our skill models between uh, a uh, unit rate like this one, if it was nine miles every two days, a lot of students would actually find that easier. 
Um, and that's part of what the uh, cognitive modeling is doing is understanding uh, students' particular um, abilities with respect to subtle problem differences like that. Next one. Um, so uh, another important tool that we're using to conduct this research is called Upgrade. Um, upgrade, you can go to the next one. Upgrade um, is partially uh, supported by another IES uh, funded grant, um, the, uh, um, which is uh, focused on um, supporting researchers in running uh, field experiments within um, digital learning platforms. Uh, and so Mathy is one of the digital learning platforms uh, supporting that grant. Uh, and in particular, that grant is helping us support um, some of these uh, different uh, experimental designs. So what Upgrade does is help you run randomized controlled trials uh, of various different designs. Uh, and it's really focused on continuous improvement. So comparing one version of an intervention to a different version of the intervention. Uh, you can use it to compare completely different interventions as well, but I think it's particularly um, helpful for these kind of uh, within product or within intervention assignments. Next slide. Um, so this is a, a view of upgrade on the right. Uh, you can see kind of the experiment dashboard. These are experiments uh, that we were running at some point. Um, upgrade is free and open source. Uh, so you can use it in your own projects and you don't need to use it with Mathia. Um, it integrates with other software. So we have used it with our Mathia platform, with another platform called MathStream. It's being used in a game called Battlesuit Numberline. Uh, and Taurus is the open learning initiative at Carnegie Mellon. Um, it's also been used or is, has been integrated into um, that platform as well um, to support um, ex field experiments like this. Um, some of the considerations, there are a number of kind of commercial software platforms that can do this kind of A-B testing or uh, uh, randomized controlled trials like this. Um, but in education, two of the particular um, characteristics that we're really concerned with reporting and that, uh, uh, with responding to and that led to the design of upgrade were group random assignment. Uh, so there are cases where you want to uh, present a consistent experience to all students in a class, for example. So if you were testing two different um, methods for teaching uh, fraction addition, let's say, um, randomly assigning that win within class might seem unfair to the students and also um, unfairly burden the teacher in terms of supporting students who are learning kind of fundamentally different approaches to the mathematics. So Upgrade allows you to do group random assignment at various levels. Uh, and then also asynchronous enrollment um, happens particularly in adaptive software. Uh, and I'll talk about that in the uh, subsequent slide. Um, so um, within schools, one of the things to think about, and again, um, Mathia uh, and, uh, is um, integrated as a um, core uh, instructional resource within students' regular classes. And so our priority is to run experiments within the students' um, natural experience within the classroom. Um, that includes features that involve content, I mean, experiments that involve content and experiments that involve features. So content would be something like uh, an experiment, like I said, on fraction addition, whereas features are um, things in the software that span content. So uh, it's just talked about thinking about the glossary uh, and usage of the glossary. The glossary is a feature in the sense that it's available through uh, throughout the um, content. Um, but the curriculum content has this kind of narrative structure. That sequence is really important. A lot of what we do as curriculum developers is think about how to sequence content. Um, like, as like reading a book, content is often encountered only once, uh, but that first encounter is special. So you can reread a chapter in a book, you can go back and do that, but a lot of times in users will read it once. And if you were running an experiment that had to do with understanding of that chapter, the student's first encounter with that chapter is maybe the one that you want to particularly collect data on, uh, because the second encounter of that chapter is going to be kind of a review. Um, and the other thing that we want to uh, recognize in this um, 
in this narrative structure is, although it's carefully constructed, it is also flexible in the sense that um, teachers and the software, if it's adaptive software, may omit, uh, insert, reorder uh, content depending on um, the student's needs. And so you can't always reliably uh, rely on a particular sequence uh, being given for every student. Um, and then also in adaptive software, typically students progress through this content at their own pace. Uh, in math, we use mastery learning, and so students progress to the next topic when they have demonstrated mastery of the additional uh, of the um, current topic. Um, and so um, it's this is we think of experiments in this context kind of like uh, clinical medical experiments where you might have criteria for um, what patients can be enrolled in a medical study and the doctor's office is essentially enrolling patients as they come in through some window of time. And that's essentially what's uh, what's going on in the experiments that we're running in Mathia using Upgrade. Um, as I said, we're also managing group software usage and we also have to think about um, how groups change. So you might be running a group assignment experiment. We have class A that gets condition A and you have class B that gets condition B. And then a student transfers from class A to class B. Um, so Upgrade allows you to control um, those kinds of anomalies and what, uh, what happens within your uh, experimental design and, and presentation uh, when those kinds of things happen. Next slide. Uh, priority on Upgrade is to make experiment design really easy. Uh, so um, you can set up and design an experiment, meaning the kind of um, uh, factors that drive uh, random assignment and data collection and all that stuff in an experiment in less than five minutes uh, with a very simple UI, in including controlling unit of assignment, uh, things about the experiment type, simple experiments, factorial within subject experiments, and then uh, things like condition weightings and uh, other uh, components of the experiment. Thanks. Um, you can also um, define the experiment uh, to support both opt-in and opt-out designs. Uh, so you can uh, basically define the overall population that you want to deliver the experiment to. And then within that population, you may uh, exclude uh, individuals, let's say, who have opted out. Uh, you can exclude particular classes, teachers, schools, or districts, or also include each of those um, uh, levels uh, of participants. Um, and then uh, also you can exclude based on prior experience. So this is related to that idea that the first experience with educational content is special. So if you, if you are running this kind of uh, fraction addition experiment, uh, since students are reaching that fraction addition at their own pace, that lesson on fraction addition, you might choose to exclude, if, if you're doing group random assignment, you might choose to exclude students who have already done fraction addition from being randomly assigned in the experiment so that they are uh, given the kind of consistent experience over time. Next slide. Um, you can also monitor progress in in uh, your experiment, we are not attempting to include a full statistics package uh, in Upgrade. The uh, model is that um, uh, Upgrade can provide you enough ex uh, information to understand how the experiment's going in general, but your kind of full data analysis, you would uh, export your condition assignments from Upgrade and do the analysis in your favorite statistics package. Okay, so let's go on to Kim. Thank you, thank you, Steve. I'm going to actually um, stop the screen share for one uh, moment so that Kim can has made a change in, in the slides. Um, so I'm going to do that now for one second. Are you good to go, Kim? Great, thank you, Jess. I'm going to request remote control. All right, so I want to turn our thinking for a little bit 
to the design process. So we have design-based research and we have co-design and they bring sort of different uh, frameworks and sensibilities. I have a user experience design background, uh, applying that to learning design. So we're kind of bringing those all together here. And let's see, boy, I'm not seeing the, okay, here we go. All right, so as Jess mentioned, design-based research is about conceptualizing interventions and implementing them iteratively. Uh, Co-design is about actively involving the stakeholders in conceptualizing those interventions. So it's relocating those end users into the formative research and design development phases. And this ensures that we're solving the right problems. Like it's sort of a user-centered design approach. We understand their needs, their pain points, their strengths. Um, it's a deep empathy sort of approach. It gives the stakeholders a voice and student agency and the input in the formative phases of design invites feedback and out of the box thinking. So from everything from empathy building to rough prototypes, we see this. So we're putting these two methods together to investigate how to support struggling readers in mafia. And we are starting with understanding. We're consulting the research base and our deep expertise. We are investigating the mafia use data uh, that allows us to focus on workspaces that we discovered were more difficult for struggling readers. And we uh, worked with the end users uh, conducting interviews, journey mapping, and surveys. So here are four of the workspaces that we found were key to work within for struggling readers. Here is an example of journey mapping where we're investigating a teacher's and students' experience over time within a Mafia lesson. Um, it was during COVID, so we had the teachers as a proxy for what the students were going through, but it's a really effective method for deep uh, recall. And so then next we brainstorm solutions and remember the air, four areas that we are working around dis discourse, context and simplification, text to speech functions, vocabulary and glossary changes and attention and perception. So lots of ideas. These were the ones that bubbled up to the top. There were general ideas as well as workspace specific ideas. And a lot of times we we'll, we used dot voting. The blue dots are for impact. The green dots are for feasibility. And this was just sort of a first take, a gut check uh, around what ideas to pursue and discuss and look into further. And then we vetted our ideas uh, for impact as well as feasibility. Feasibility was teased out into design content and the implementation of development. And this is what that looked like. So we have low impact on the left, high on the right, and then how the ideas played out from easy to very difficult at the bottom. And the colored stickies are, this is somewhat of a three-dimensional map. Colored stickies are technical feasibility and the gray boxes are design and content feasibility. So um, I want you to think for just a minute uh, about these three terms and keep them, the concepts in mind. So impact is stra fairly straightforward. We may be fairly sure that uh, certain features and supports in online learning development uh, on, online learning environments can be impactful. Feasibility uh, is the question about, can we execute the idea? Um, is it realistic given the constraints and resources of the project scope and implementation within the existing Mathia software environment? And finally, value. Will a design feature be used? This can be a gotcha. Um, it will only be used if the end user finds it of value or utility. So if we build it, they will not necessarily use it. So 
uh, here we're experimenting and testing uh, with an idea before putting too many eggs in the basket, if you will. So this is where, can I go back? This is where the process pathways come into play with a feasibility and value questions. So we have three process pathways. The first one is for ideas that are relatively straightforward and they're highly likely to have a high impact and value, relatively straightforward implementation. We can take them right into agile design and development. Pathway two, may have a high impact and value, but we may uh, want to investigate uh, more extensive testing before agile design and development. And pathway three, uh, we need more product discovery. There are more questions around either implementation or value or both. So here is just a very high level view of the process pathway one, where you can have a design hypothesis, you uh, you test and learn, <clears throat> and you uh, base, uh, once validated, you take it right into uh, the design and development process. So here, this idea is about set text simplification in the form of word problem rewrites. And Stephen will be sharing a little bit more about what we did with that idea. Process pathway two is uh, a few more steps. You might want to prototype a bit first and test in various ways, anything from paper prototyping to digital high fidelity prototyping, then move it into uh, the upgrade system, then on to uh, developing it, implementing it within Mathia. And finally, process pathway three may have more head scratchers. So it's it can be, you can have any number of these iterations where you are co-designing uh, an idea. You may be sitting down with your end users or virtually sitting down with them, building things in a very scrappy, formative way, testing ideas with them, low fidelity paper prototyping, higher fidel fidelity, interactive or clickable prototypes, and then on to the large scale experimentation. So th there are the three pathways together just to give you an idea of what they look like. And now on to Stephen. Thank you, Kim. And I'm going to give back over uh, stopping remote control. So back to you, Jess. Thanks again, Kim, and thanks, Jess, for driving the slides here. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. So we're going to give a sampling of some of the uh, experiments we've run to date, um, both as a part of this project, uh, part of the Marx project, work with uh, to enhance Mathia supports for struggling readers, as well as uh, give a little flavor of some of the other things we're doing, um, thinking about using upgrade. Uh, you know, as a uh, conduit for research on the Mathia digital learning platform. Um, so to the process pathway, one example that Kim was talking about, uh, about discourse simplification, text simplification, um, we were looking at a particular Mathia topic uh, around analyzing models, two-step integers. Um, on the left, the screenshot isn't great here, but the idea in this workspace is that um, we're given students with, you know, sort of via text, uh, a problem scenario and um, an equation that models the scenario. Uh, and the goal for the students are to take the different expressions within that equation and match them up with text that describes sort of their, their importance in the scenario. Um, so we thought, you know, we'll, via data analysis, we'd identify that this was uh, clearly a workspace where um, reading uh, was, was very important for the students to be able to uh, develop mastery of the skills involved. Um, and so we wanted to think about um, could we simplify the text in certain ways, enhance the readability of the text in various ways to um, make the, the workspace uh, a bit more um, achievable, increase the mastery and other sorts of outcome measures for uh, struggling readers and for readers as you know, all readers, but uh, focusing especially on struggling readers. So we developed a style guide um, to sort of uh, provide to uh, internal folks with a CAST and a Carnegie Learning to, to work through this workspace. So it's about 200 problems uh, in each of two workspaces here. One is about integers, uh, one involves integers in the problem statements, um, and one involves rational numbers. So it's, it's a slightly higher grade level, it's grade eight content with rational numbers. 
Um, but we, you know, so we had humans, you know, folks, uh, subject matter experts at Carnegie Learning and CAST rewrite uh, these problems according to the style guide for enhanced readability. So after we did that, we deployed um, a user level randomized experiment testing our sort of business as usual condition, which is, you know, sort of the content as it was, the content as it was in Mathia uh, versus content uh, in, you know, that's been rewritten for this enhanced readability. Uh, we reached about 14,000 students over the course of about three months uh, in this current school year. That's three months, a um, little under three months, I think it was. Um, you know, so to Steve's point about folks uh, experiencing content at different times in the school year, um, that can vary depending on when you deploy uh, your experiment in, in terms of content, but we we're very happy to, you know, have uh, you know, RCT over 14,000 students just for these two topics. Uh, and we looked at uh, the two we'll, the two outcome measures we'll consider today are time to completion on this content and uh, the extent to which students mastered the skills associated with these two pieces of content. There's some other measures you might you might consider, and we also have seen some impacts on those as well, but we'll just focus on those two today. But first, we're going to do an interactive poll. I'm going to make this fun here a little bit, maybe. I don't know how fun it'll be, but we'll see how it goes. Um, so I'm going to try to launch the poll. We're trying to we're trying to make things exciting here. Um, I'm going to try to launch poll one. Uh, and your question is: uh, On which of these two word problems are struggling readers more likely to perform well? So which of these basically has maybe enhanced readability that struggling readers might find helpful as they they try to solve uh, problems in this workspace? So I'll read them aloud. Um, option one: Members of the soccer fan club went to a minor league soccer game. Each member paid $23 for a ticket to the game. The members spent a total of $125 on food and beverages at the game. The equation Y equals 23X plus 125 models the amount of money the club spent at the soccer game. Option one. Option two, members of the soccer club so members of the soccer fan club decide to go to a minor league soccer game. Tickets to the soccer game sell for $23 each. Club members also spent a total of $125 on food and beverages. Situation can be modeled by the equation Y equals 23X plus 125 plus 125. So in this workspace, you can sort of see how we're giving a scenario uh, you know, that involves um, a linear equation, uh, and integers in this case, um, and students would, they, they would need to take the components of the equation and, and match them to sort of parts of the problem that, uh, that they represent. So we've got four answers in the six answers in, in the poll so far. Uh, it's getting interesting here, friends. Uh, I'm gonna let it, I'll let you guys read. My, my reading is probably terrible. I read aloud and I'm like, wow, uh, I, maybe I am a struggling reader. Uh, so I'll give you guys a second. I'll just be quiet and let you look at both options. Not sure if our co-hosts are cheating and know the answer to this and have responded or not, but I'm actually not able to respond. Yeah, okay. It doesn't I, maybe, okay. Respond. okay. 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 <laughs> so this is fair. This is good. This is good. Um, so yeah, effectively we're asking which which of these two is more readable. And really one is one is sort of a business as usual problem, and one has been rewritten for readability and in the sort of that experimental condition in the A B test I was talking about, the the randomized experiment I was talking about. All right. Everybody, I think we've got 84% of participants are uh, responded. And Susan's not going to respond. Susan Berman, she's from Carnegie Learning and she's uh, uh, yeah, not a co-host, but she's not answering. So thank you, Susan. That's okay. So I think we're good. And April probably had, didn't vote either. And she's also from Carnegie Learning. So, okay, we, get, we, have, we have all, everybody's responded. Just next slide. The winner, option one. Uh, so option one was in fact the rewritten, uh, Example: So the rewritten problem with enhanced with, 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 with what we hoped is enhanced readability. Uh, to be clear, and so that actually didn't win in the poll. So this is contrary to to our uh, our friends on the on the calls intuitions about readability. Uh, we could talk more about um, those intuitions maybe later. Uh, good topic for discussion. Um, so we had thirty six percent said option one, sixty four percent said option two. Uh, option one turned out to be 
uh, both what was rewritten and the one that turned out to be more effective. So next slide, please. So, so when we looked at this sort of randomized trial of this revised content versus our business as usual content, um, we, we, I, like I said, we're gonna focus on two different uh, outcome measures here. Uh, one was time to completion of the revised content. Um, and so this is just focusing on, on students who are struggling readers. Uh, so it turned out that um, there's an impact on time to completion for both uh, struggling readers and the population as at large, but we're just focusing on the struggling readers here um, in, in the spirit of our, our Nixer funding and in thinking about you know, our, our target population of interest really. Um, we really wanted to figure out what's, what supports struggling readers. Uh, and if it also has an impact on, on the broader population, great. But uh, so it's really remarkable actually. This, is, this result was, was very surprising. I think we said that on that impact scale that Kim showed you, I think we thought that you know, readability was obviously important and was going to be higher impact, but I don't think we quite envisioned the level of uh, impact we had here. So, so the purple, um, so there's two, two workspaces we're showing here, two topics, integers. Uh, so the example you saw was an integers problem. There's also a rational, a rational number um, instead of uh, a topic in grade eight. The impact there wasn't as, as, as pronounced in grade eight, but in grade seven on the integers topic, um, struggling readers in the rewritten content for this readability, you know, these rewritten for readability completed the content nearly 30 minutes quicker. So that's, uh, uh, that's a median time savings. So, so the median student completed the content nearly 30 minutes quicker. That's nearly a, an entire class period, just on a single math topic that we saved time in terms of their completion. Um, really remarkable result there. And that, that, had us, that has us thinking a lot about how to, how to scale up this sort of work to more topics, because obviously if we can have this kind of impact just on one uh, topic and we, we can scale it up to more topics, we can really have an impact on struggling readers as they're working in Mathia. Um, so, so the next slide, so you might say, but Steve, you know, okay, they finished the topic, they finished the topic uh, quicker. Um, did they master the, the they, maybe, they, maybe they finished without mastery. So maybe that was, that's maybe uh, a red herring here. Uh, but it turns out that in addition to completing it more quickly, uh, th this, this is a graph of what's called promotion rate. So this is when students, uh, promotion is, is bad uh, in this case. Um, it's a sort of an internal term of art, but it's, it's sort of the promotion rate is the rate at which students are moved on to the subsequent topic without having achieved mastery of all their skills. So we want students to achieve mastery of all their skills and then move on to the topic. We don't want them to be promoted. Um, and we saw a several percentage point uh, improvement from rewritten content. Uh, compared to the original content. So, so more students, uh, most struggling readers, again, focusing on the struggling readers, more struggling readers are mastering these skills and they're doing so in less time. Can't ask for a better result, I would say. Uh, we, were, we were pretty pretty surprised by the, the, uh, the magnitude of that result, that we could get better mastery in that much less time just on one topic. So you think about how can we take this and maybe scale up to, so right now the this, this, the style guide that we've developed uh, for readability is great, um, but it's also pretty labor intensive to have folks sort of uh, rewrite. Um, in, in most cases, there's something like 30 problem scenarios and we have some complicated processes that lead us to generating more problems and so on. Um, but you know, if we could think about ways to maybe automate this process a little bit better um, or, or take uh, use, use AI and, and some more advanced methods that have been, um, I'm sure people are talking about, uh, how could we use those to improve this authoring process to enhance readability across more topics more efficiently. So next slide. We're exploring whether we can get large language models, which I'm sure you've heard of. Uh, so I, you know, at some point you have to hear about large language models and I talk at this point if you're even tangentially related to, related to AI. So you know, I am here for you today to have your uh, fill of large language models and AI. Um, but this is really exciting. I think this is really interesting. Um, for the same workspace, so think about the same topic could we get a large language model to generate readable text, readable content uh, in much the same way as the humans used a style guide uh, and produced you know, this work? So we could can we train a large language model to use the same style guide, style guide to rewrite our content, to help us revise content, basically? So I want to see if another poll here. So I'm going to close the, I guess I should share results on the last poll. Sorry. Uh, sorry about that. I forgot to share results. I just told you the results. So, but try to launch the second poll. Uh, this poll is, can you tell the difference between content? So, so it's a different problem here, but can you tell the difference between content that was re re rewritten by our human subject matter experts and what had substantial contributions from a large language model? So which one was sort of 
uh, it's a semi-automated process. We're not at the point where this is fully automatic, uh, anything like that. We're still sort of a lot of quality assurance, these sorts of things. But in, in, in this case, you know, the large language model contributed quite a lot. And in fact, I think probably the entire problem text comes from the large language model. There's other things about encoding problems and so on that sometimes the large language models uh, kind of don't do a perfect job of just yet. Um, so we read through the two options. Uh, Concepcion and Monica are opening up a lemonade stand this summer. They spend $17 at the store to buy drink mix, sugar, and paper cups. They sell each cup of lemonade for $2. The equation Y equals 2X minus 17 models the profit made by Concepcion and Monica selling lemonade. Option two, Concepcion and Monica opened a lemonade stand. They invested $17 in drink mix, sugar, and paper cups. Concepcion and Monica decide to sell each cup of lemonade for $2. The equation Y equals 2X minus 17 models the lemonade stand sales and expenses. Guys... We, do have, we do have one question in the chat for you while people are taking the poll. Was, sure. the, was the prompt make this passage easier to read? Uh, the, the prompt was much more sophisticated than that. Uh, so there was um, you know, some encoding uh, of this. Uh, so there's an entire sort of art, uh, maybe a science, hopefully eventually um, emerging of prompt engineering. So this is this is not to say uh, it was a very simple prompt. There was a lot of work that went into getting to a set of prompts that we felt were uh, delivering um, good results from the large language model. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a great question. This is not something simple like, please rewrite this for uh, e ease of reading. Um, it, it, it is a sort of a multi, uh, multi-faceted uh, set of prompts that we worked through uh, encoding parts of the um, style guides. Uh, I'm not sure if we actually use any examples, um, but yeah, there, there's, there's, a, there's some details that we'll be, uh, we'll be publishing these details soon about how we went through the prompt engineering process to get to where we're at. Um, so yeah, non-trivial. Uh, it's 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 not. It's still a very semi-automated process. Uh, so, I think our response rate is a little less this time. People uh, not sure which which option is LLM versus humans. This also isn't like an incredibly sophisticated problem. To be clear, so like. You know, you might not be surprised that the LLM might be hard to distinguish from the human rewrites. I, I grant that. I just wanted to make things a little fun with the with the polls since we knew they were available. All right. So I think in the interest of of time, uh, we'll, we'll end the poll. And it looks like uh, option one won out as likely uh, to be the one. Um, that included substantial contributions from a large language model, but it turns out actually option two was the one that was, so just give you back the slide. Option two was actually the large language model uh, example, so, but it's very close. We're only one vote off here. You know, so it was five five to four. Um, so I think it was a bit of, bit of a toss up, um, but yeah, we happy in the discussion to return to maybe some of these examples, um, but uh, yeah. So we're thinking about how to use uh, large language models to sort of scale up these results across more content more quickly, more effectively, maybe more effectively. We'll, 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 so um, any day now, we'll be we'll be deploying an A-B test that tests out uh, this large language model content against our business as usual content. And in the fall, we'll be doing a, a more sophisticated experiment that tests, well, maybe not, less, it's the same, roughly the same structure. We'll be testing out our rewritten content since it works so well, the rewritten content versus the large language model content over our, over our user base and sort of better understand uh, what's driving, what, what, if the large language model content can actually do better than the human rewrites, or maybe the human rewrites are actually uh, uh, are the best performers. We don't have that data yet, so stay tuned. Um, that, that's, uh, yeah, it's exciting. Um, next slide, please. So another aspect of uh, discourse uh, context um, that we've been working on uh, was thinking about problem personalization. So thinking about um, the extent to which we can present word problems to students that use names that are local to their contexts uh, in schools. Um, so this was work um, that's both uh, related to our, our work in the Marx project, but we also submitted it as uh, part of the XPRIZE Digital Learning Challenge. Um, so in this case, we work with five partner school districts um, to personalize the names that appeared in problems to names that were frequently occurring in these districts. So very diverse districts. One district was 100% Native American, another was uh, majority Latinx. Um, we uh, basically generated 26,000 new word problems 
that were sort of uh, personalized to these districts. Um, and we did this over 24 math topics. We did quite a lot of work here um, with, you know, in, in populations that were uh, 10 to 23 percent ESL, so English as a second language, um, and 13 to 16 percent special education. Um, some of these results, we have some results here, but I'm not going to, we don't really have time to get into them today. Um, but I just wanted to sort of give you another example of where we're thinking about how we might support struggling readers um, as a part of this work and using upgrade to sort of drive uh, user level random assignment studies in this case. Uh, so Jess, next slide, please. Um, so to move outside of the context of supporting struggling readers and thinking more broadly about the use of upgrade um, within Mathia sort of digital learning platform research. Uh, this is an example of uh, a study we facilitated by researchers at University of Wisconsin and Carnegie Mellon, uh, where we inserted um, videos that explained sort of the utility value of mathematics in students' real lives and asked them to reflect uh, on that utility value. So sort of picking out uh, what among a set of statements like really sort of resonated with them in terms of the use of math in their real lives. Um, so we used we had six different math topics where we deployed this sort of intervention. Um, and in, in this current school year, just ending school year, uh, reached over 32,000 students with um, user level random assignment. So a randomized trial of, of this sort of intervention. Uh, and we actually assigned each of the activities uh, independently. So you can kind of get dosage effects. Some students would maybe get one video, some would get zero, uh, and some might get all six, depending upon where they are in the school year in their content uh, to some of the complexities that Steve Ritter was talking about earlier uh, as we deploy these across the large user bases. Um, so again, that, this is a research we facilitated from external researchers. So uh, I know there are some results. I don't have them for you today. Don't have time to, to present them anyway. Um, but th this is a, a PhD student at University of Wisconsin um, and uh, Judith Tarakevich and Ken Katinger at Carnegie Mellon all involved in this work. So um, hopefully we'll have, we'll have more to say uh, very soon about this work. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and this is another example um, where we used a co-design process to think about a digital manipulative for students to better understand number lines in, in Mathia. Um, so, you know, in a co-design process with teachers and uh, academic researchers, we developed three different sort of number line manipulatives. Uh, one sort of focused on just notions of opposites on the number line. One had a kangaroo that hopped. Uh, so it's on the left here, there's a sort of an interact, that's an interactive manipulative that has a number line there. Uh, one sort of featured a kangaroo hopping back and forth on the number line. Another uh, visualized a thermometer. Um, and so uh, we're, we're, we'll be very soon, if we, I'm actually not even sure the status on this one, April might be able to tell us in the discussion where exactly we are on, whether we've deployed this uh, in, in thinking about the different outcome measures that we care about. Um, in this case, we're, we're thinking a lot about uh, measuring performance on workspaces that, so, topics or workspaces that are subsequent to this work um, that depend a lot on the skills students and the concepts, the conceptual understanding students develop while they work with this explore tool or this manipulative. Uh, so just trying to give you a sense of the different types of outcome measures that are possible. Just thinking about process measures, thinking about maybe more uh, distal learning outcomes that could be within the product still, or, or it could be as distal or um, as sort of something like a standardized test score. So just trying to give you a, sample, uh, a set of interventions that are possible, some of which are related to struggling readers, some of which are uh, also a little bit beyond that scope. Um, and I hope that's been uh, reasonably helpful. Uh, next slide, Jess, I think that's all we had. So. And I think I'm a little bit over time. Looks so. I apologize for that. But uh, no, no, I think no worries. Um, I um, so we uh, uh, hope that was um, useful and helpful and provocative. Um, um, perhaps we can answer some questions and get some discussion going. So um, I'll turn it over to Sarah if she wants to um, um, yes. kick we, us off. Yeah, we definitely want to take this time to have um, time for questions. Just to warn everyone, this session will automatically end at 2.15, no chance to go over. So if anyone leaves early, remember to take the survey and also to rate this session on the agenda. We really would appreciate it. But I know there's a lot of information, really interesting things that they're doing. I know I got the poll questions wrong. <laughs> So I, I think, you know, it really made me think about what does it mean to make text different, um, you know, more accessible for students with reading disabilities. So we'd love to hear your questions or um, also any comments. If you want to share any other resources, if any of you are doing similar work, you're welcome to put you know, links in the chat. Uh, you can also um, raise your hand and um, speak out loud um, if you'd like to ask a question that way. And I'll call on you.
Um, Jess, if you want to stop sharing too, you can um, see people. And uh, if you guys want to uh, use your webcams to show your face, it makes it a little bit more personal for the discussion. So, so I put this in the chat, but I'd love to hear, uh, particularly that first poll, uh, since most people did uh, have the intuition that um, uh, that one of the problems would be easier than the other, which was not um, didn't correspond to our data. I think that's really interesting because it it did fit the sense that we had when we were reading rewriting these problems, as Steve said, like we were really surprised at the magnitude of the effects because it wasn't like the original problems were terribly written. Uh, it seemed kind of perfectly reasonable phrasing. And so like if people are able to share um, their uh, intuitions or their rubrics or why they thought uh, one problem would be easier than another, I'd, I'd love to hear that. And I put the um, first problem answer on the first poll answer on the screen again. I, I can just comment as a former math teacher, I actually was concerned about the original item because it, in a way it's set up to read almost as the equation is written. So not that it's dumbing down the cognitive demand, but that is something you know concerning because that's not how problems are written often on state tests. They're a little bit more challenging, you have to figure out. So I liked this option one, but I also thought it was longer and maybe more complicated. So I thought maybe that was your original one. And I was concerned that you were making it you know, less cognitive demand. So I was actually pleased that I was wrong. And um, somehow, and I'm actually pleased at the results of that first one. That's what we want students to be, to be doing. Yeah, and I wonder too, as academics, especially sometimes we like to use lots of words. And so the constant messaging I've gotten for students and, and everyone, they're like, less words, cut it down, make it shorter, less words. So I was thinking like, oh, option two has got to be it because it is the sentences are more concise and it's yeah. shorter. But I think to your point, Sarah, maybe it's this idea of the more words in there aren't also aren't just like more words for the sake of making it longer, but there may be something about how they help interpret the content, right. and particularly in math, that may yeah. be a really important piece. And, and um, as we're investigating, really, in many cases, simplification doesn't mean making it shorter. It means making it more coherent um, and making those making some of the inferences explicit so that um, because the inferences actually turn out to be very difficult for struggling readers. So some of that is really counter to what people believe text simplification is about. Um, so that is uh, maybe a little bit of a shift from uh, traditional work in text simplification. So a simple example of that here is if you look at the first sentence, um, in the original sentence, the members decide to go to a minor league soccer game, but you never actually say that they go, right? Whereas the rewritten version says, yes, they went to a minor league soccer game. So it's a very subtle kind of change, but you could imagine it's important for students who are really struggling and might focus on that word decide and say, well, maybe the cost has to do with their decision and, you know, all these you know, introducing all sorts of complications that don't happen in the rewritten version. And, and Whitney uh, brings up um, uh, thinking about the coherence of option one, there may be some uh, uh, set, I'm sorry, the sentence subject overlap uh, about members in option one. Um, and we're, we're looking into uh, sort of quantifying the differences in these rewrites uh, and then also thinking about the what the LLMs produce um, and sort of getting a better understanding at maybe a sentence level or you know I have a better I have a better quantification of what the differences are between these different options and what's producing better results um, and how consistent that might be across topics that we end up targeting. Uh, so that's a really good point. Maybe I'll go to the second problem. This is the large language model. Um, versus human rewrite, the um, option two is the LLM version. We do have a comment in the chat that by, from Whitney, she wonders if Cometrics would help with quantifying the cohesion across sentences. That's exactly yes. what we're looking at. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we, wonderful. 
yeah, and we, some of the we, uh, the newer Arte um, metrics as well. Uh, yeah, so that's exactly that's exactly the the road we're going down. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, the and and the co metrics. I mean, we see mixed results so far on that, but we're still in the middle of the investigation. The other thing I'd say is the um, the Terrence model that Barbara Arfe and colleagues um, have um, developed um, the, for students with disabilities. Um, we we think that model has a lot of promise, and that actually is really based on these ideas of coherence. And um, so it's again a kind of a newer conception of text simplification, um, which is actually more aligned with um, cognitive models of uh, discourse comprehension, um, a Kinchin you know, Van Dyke. So um, we think that's probably going to be more useful. We do have a question in the chat from Katie. I may have missed it. Did you share the framework for the rewrite? What about the framework method for collaborating with practitioners on study design? We um, no, we did not share. Oh, sorry, you were going to say, Stephen. No, go ahead, Jess. Yeah, we didn't share the actual um, like the guide the the um, guidelines that we used to do the rewrites, um, uh, and we didn't. Oh, sure. uh, we should do that and we should also say a little bit more about how we worked with teachers in co-design around um, some of these things but we gave them options we actually asked we did went through a number of steps um, so we did ask teachers to um, look at a number of these problems in some of the, these workspaces and actually provide rewrites that they would use um, with struggling readers um, we um, uh, and that was very informative. Um, their comments certainly um, pointed us in the right direction in terms of some of this work. We also um, um, gave them surveys um, to basically do a, make a choice in a forced choice between various versions. So we, um, we went through a number of steps. This is all small sample work, but it was all incredibly helpful in terms of uh, informing our work or the, you know, some of the experiments that we've reported on. Um, so more to come on that. Well, we, we I think there's going to be um, additional additional dissemination that so that people can see what we um, how we did our work. And there are a suite of other features that we have developed more with uh, some of the more explicit um, processes that that Kim uh, illuminated. We just didn't focus on them as much. Uh, yeah. We had some results to share. Uh, about the, the rewrites um yeah and uh, we're still we're still working on on the results on on, on others yeah uh, in fact we're doing some post hoc analysis of the problems that were rewritten just to figure out okay now that we've seen this big effect can we get a little bit more insight into what's going on so we've been looking digging deeply into that so um all of that i think is going to inform the work going forward and just as a program officer, I think this is really important, this discussion, because this um, project had a very serious, intense panel discussion before it was funded, because, you know, why would IES Department of Ed fund something that would benefit a provider of a product? Um, yeah. But it really mark, uh, argued for the openness of what you're learning to the science, as well as the research for the field. And so that's why I appreciate these kinds of conversations, you know, connecting to theory, connecting it to working with practitioners, because that is the kind of work that we want to fund. So if you're interested in doing this kind of work in the future, you would, with some, a different product or process, you definitely want to reach out to them about how did they get through panels and, you know, get a successful proposal, because this type of project is challenging to get funded. Yeah. Well, it did, it did take a few tries, but that's that's part of the course. <laughs> that, that much I'll say. And 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 to that point, uh, Sarah, there, you know, there's also papers that will be um, at the AI Ed conference and the Educational Data Mining conference around a lot of the work we've been doing um, to identify the particular areas within Mathia uh, where, where readers are struggling in terms of at the knowledge component level and then at um, places where their performance, uh, learner's performance um, is is more, core, oh, there, there are these particular workspaces where we can look at uh, performance on ELA scores, so tests of, of English language arts performance at the end of the year, and sort of better understand like, well, this this bit of content is actually more correlated with reading than it is with math. Some, you know, there's a, a couple of different ways of quantifying that. So we've got some 
um, and, and also predicting students reading performance from their math performance or their performance in Mathia. Um, so we have we've got some uh, papers around those processes and some of those models coming out uh, in the next few months. Uh, so the, the way that's of, super you know, powerful because the frustrating part about the NAEP data is kids who take the math NAEP data do not take their ELA, you know, reading NAEP. So you can't do these kind of analyses. And so when you have a product that can have data on both, it's like really exciting, I think, for this field. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Just a quick reminder that we do have the link to the survey in the chat. And also, if you could please rate this um, session so we can have more like it in the future um, in, in the agenda of the uh, PI meeting platform, that would be great. And please um, feel free to raise your hand. We'd be glad to have you come off mic and ask a question or comment. Um, and also, if you, any of you want to share any work that's similar that you're doing, we would love to hear that too. I'll just, I have a question that might be tangentially related, but I'm just curious. Do, do you think, you know, it'll be kind of near future or far future that the kind of um, fully automated version of revising this kind of text, like, do you think there's always going to need to be a person somewhat involved or do you think it'll, it will move to a fully automated space at some point? That could easily take up the rest of the session. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I'm kind of the AI optimist on this in the sense that I think it, does pretty, as you saw, you know, it's hard to tell the difference now. Um, and we had a little discussion about the prompting. You, it's, it's not as easy as saying, just rewrite this. So what we tried to do was have it rewrite according to our rubric. And the challenge is kind of like, how do you explain that rubric to the AI in a way that it, it actually kind of abides by the rubric um but you know it doesn't take that much fiddling to get to a version that you know people judge as being a reasonable implementation of the rubric uh, i'll say with people also like the uh, when we rewrote them our original model was well our, our hope was oh we'll develop this rubric with this guide uh which was really pretty short to a three-page um guide um and we had people independently write problems and then other people review those problems. We thought that would be okay with one writer and one reviewer, but honestly, it came back to we had a couple of kind of group reviews and all that stuff. So the the, the rewrites of the problems was a substantial amount of work. Uh, it probably would have been easier the second round because some of that work was refining the rubric and the style guide and some of the work was just clarifying um, what was allowed. So, you know, as you saw, we tried to keep the problems, the situations exactly the same and the numbers exactly the same. Uh, but sometimes with the vocabulary, there was there were some disputes about you know, is this like simplifying this vocabulary fundamentally changing the problem in some way and things like that. Yeah. Uh, and the AI doesn't struggle with those kinds of existential issues. It just <laughs> cracks out words. So. <laughs> yeah, well, one part of my question was spurred by the fact that I got that one wrong also. So I couldn't tell the difference. <laughs> I, I also really didn't, I, I picked like among the, I think maybe the second choice I had, uh, I really wasn't cherry picking those to make that a like a, anything super difficult or anything like that. Uh, it was, it was, um, I wish I had a, a more sly, uh, like, oh, I knew I was going to get people with these two. I, I really wasn't sure uh, where that would go. So uh, I pre we appreciate your participation. <laughs> I will say chat GPT, uh, you know, when I, play around with it to have it write word problems. It has a surprising obsession with lemonade stands. It loves word problems that are about lemonade stands. Mm. Uh, <laughs> because I, I think there are probably a lot of those kinds of examples out in the world. Um, but um, beyond kind of rewriting for simplicity, another thing that we're really interested in is how 
um, problems that match students' interests and experience make the reading experience easier for them. Yeah. Um, and so we envision, you know, like if if we could get to the point where these AI models can write problems easily uh, and and you know consistently and accurately. Um, you might imagine a future where where students can really say like, hey, could you write me a problem about basketball, you know, that's about poor proportional reasoning or something and, you know, really have a very personalized experience like that. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. And again, just as you heard Jess say, persistence is key. So if you're going to apply in this topic area, come talk to me and do not give up. If you've already applied before and gotten negative feedback, <laughs> um, come back and I'll work with you on getting a, a revision, a resubmission, because we do need more work in this area. Thank you very much for attending. We hope this was a, a, a good session. We certainly enjoyed it and uh, look forward to sharing more in the future.